Hello, dear students. Today, we will start with the topic of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process which is responsible for the existence of life on the surface of Earth. It is a process which is carried out by all green parts of a plant. It is this process which produces the life-supporting gas, oxygen. It is this process which directly or indirectly provides food to all life on Earth. So let's study with this, this process in detail. Photosynthesis is basically a process carried out in the presence of sunlight. All green parts having chlorophyll use carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. The water is absorbed by the roots and they produce food in the form of glucose. Oxygen is released as a byproduct. This photosynthesis needs to be carried out in green parts because the green parts have the cell organelle called chloroplast. Now chloroplast is found in all leaves and soft green tissue of the plant. The chloroplast has the capacity to produce uh, trap sunlight and produce the oxygen and the glucose. For this, the chloroplasts are evenly distributed in these surfaces. There are roughly more than 500,000 chloroplasts per square millimeter of leaf surface. And this makes the leaves as the best suited structure for absorption of sunlight and performing photosynthesis. So as you can see how vast distribution, the huge amount of uh, concentration of the, the chloroplast is found in leaves. That is why they're the best suited structure for photosynthesis. Now, before you proceed with photosynthesis, you need to know the structure of a chloroplast. Chloroplasts are loosely called as the kitchen of the cells. They are called so because they perform photosynthesis. So these chloroplasts have a double membrane structure, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. The outer membrane is called as the outer periplastidial membrane. The inner membrane is called as the inner periplastidial membrane. These two membranes are separated by a periplastidial space, which is filled with a periplastidial fluid. Inside the inner membrane, we have the thylakoids, and it is these thylakoids which have the pigment called chlorophyll. Now, these thylakoids are not present singularly, but rather are arranged like a pile, one on top of each other. This pile is called a granum. The granum and the fret. The fret is the structure which connects the two granum together. It is this which has the pigment called chlorophyll. On the other hand, the ground substance, which is called as the stroma or the matrix, has no chlorophyll. But these two structures, the granum and the stroma, have the major role in the process of photosynthesis. Now, though there are nine types of chlorophyll in any plant, it will have nine different types of chlorophyll. But chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are the most important. They vary a little bit in their color, but they're are these structures which have maximum absorption of sunlight. Now, chlorophyll is one pigment which can be synthesized only in the case of a plant being exposed to sunlight. When a plant is not exposed to sunlight, either the chlorophyll will not be synthesized or if it is exposed to too much of sunlight or too much of intense heat, then the sun chlorophyll will be destroyed. So both of these cases are called as etiolation or solarization. So what is etiolation? Now this occurs in the absence of sunlight. When there is no sunlight, the chlorophyll is not formed. And when there is no chlorophyll which is formed, another pigment called etiolin is synthesized. Etiolation can be observed if you keep a plant away from sunlight for a couple of days. Within a week, let's say, the green chlorophyll gets degenerated 
and instead of chlorophyll, a yellowish colored etiolin is synthesized. Or you observe it in a, a grassy patch where a small rock is covering a piece of a patch of grass. You remove the rock and you will notice that the grass underneath that rock has turned yellowish. This is due to etiolation. So etiolation is a process which reduces the oxygen, the uh, synthesis of chlorophyll and therefore the capacity of a plant to perform photosynthesis. Ultimately, etiolation will lead to death of a plant. The second process solarization is when any plant is exposed to high intensity of sunlight. When it is exposed to high intensity of light, and especially if it is dehydrated, that means it has less water. In that case, the plant parts will start becoming dry. There is destruction of chlorophyll. There is oxidation of chlorophyll in the presence of sunlight, which is called as photooxidation. And the entire plant becomes dry and brittle. This is called as solarization. So here, this is an irreversible process. Once it has occurred, nothing happens to change the plant back to its actual condition. Solarization also results in the death of a plant. Solarization can be used in a beneficial way to remove the germs and the bacteria and the fungi from a soil uh, in, in a field by exposing it to sunlight. But in a plant with regards to photosynthesis, it is a process which indicates the destruction of chlorophyll. So both etiolation and solarization lead to death of a plant. Now, we need to start with how the process of photosynthesis occurs. For studying how, you need to know about the structures called as guard cells. But before we move on to the guard cells, you need to know about the section of a leaf. If a leaf is taken and a small section is cut, as you can see in this picture here, the upper and the lower epidermis, here, these two structures, do not have any chlorophyll in them. Only the structures which are found here, the structure labeled J, that is the guard cell, has got chlorophyll. So if you see in this picture, the upper epidermis as well as the lower epidermis has no chloroplasts in it. The mesophyll cells, the palisade and the spongy irregular uh, parenchymator cells, these two have got chlorophyll. And in the lower epidermis, you have the guard cells which have, which have chlorophyll and hence can perform photosynthesis. Now, this means that the guard cells will be the first structure which should facilitate photosynthesis in taking place. Now, these guard cells regulate the opening of a structure called stoma. They regulate it by opening and closing. How do these guard cells open and close? As you can see in this picture, in this GIF image, that is explained with the help of two theories. One is called as the sugar concentration theory. This is the old theory. It is discarded nowadays, but it is still studied. The potassium ion concentration theory is the modern and the accepted theory. So let's study these two detail, in detail. Now, the guard cell has a structure, especially in case of the uh, dicot plants that the guard cells are bean shaped and their inner wall is thicker as compared to their outer wall. It is this difference in their inner and outer wall thickness which enables their opening and closing. So let's study how it does that. So during daytime, the guard cells start or begin photosynthesis. Why do they start that? Because the guard cells have got chlorophyll in them. So more the moment, sunlight falls on the chlorophyll, the guard cells become activated and they start the process of photosynthesis. Once they start with the process of photosynthesis, they are able to produce glucose. Glucose is the primary sugar product produced. Now, due to formation of glucose, 
the guard cells become hypertonic. That means their osmotic pressure increases. Now, when their osmotic pressure increases, it allows the water from the surrounding epidermal cells to enter inside the guard cells by endosmosis. So water starts entering inside the guard cells by endosmosis. When the water enters the guard cells by endosmosis, it makes the guard cells turgid. Once the guard cells have become turgid, they will have to obviously bulge outwards because of their inner thick walls and their outer thin walls. So the bulging is produced outwards. And when this happens, the stoma, we say, they open. This is during daytime when the sunlight falls on the guard cells. So once the stoma are open, the exchange of gases occurs through the stoma or stomata, and then the process of photosynthesis can be carried out throughout the day. At night, there is no photosynthesis. So there is no production of glucose. The guard cells no longer are hypertonic. The water goes out by exosmosis. The guard cells become flaccid and they close the stomatal opening. So the reverse is happening at night. This is the sugar concentration theory. This was the old theory and this, has, this is the discarded theory, but we still study this theory. Next, we have the potassium ion concentration theory. There's a little change in the potassium ion concentration theory. The first step here also is that during daytime, the guard cells start or they begin photosynthesis. And after they begin photosynthesis, they produce glucose. Now the change comes here. Once they have produced glucose, this glucose is used in the process of respiration. Now respiration is a process which releases energy in the form of ATP. Now, once this energy is produced in the form of ATP, this ATP is used to actively push potassium ions inside the guard cells. So instead of the glucose making the guard cells hypertonic, the potassium concentration inside the guard cells will make them hypertonic. This raises their osmotic pressure. And once their osmotic pressure is raised, water enters from the surrounding epidermal cells by process of endosmosis. The guard cells become turgid. Once the guard cells have become turgid, the uh, guard cells bulge outwards due to their inner thick wall and outer thin wall and the stoma opens. So here, the only difference between the sugar concentration theory and potassium ion concentration theory is in this part, these three structures. So here, the glucose, that glucose directly makes the guard cells hypertonic. If you talk about the sugar concentration theory, from here, directly we come on to here. But when we move and we understand that glucose is used in respiration, the respiration produces ATP. The ATP is used to actively push potassium ions inside the guard cells, which makes them hypertonic. Then you're talking about the potassium ion concentration theory. At night, reverse happens. There is no photosynthesis. There is no glucose production. The glucose is not used in respiration. Whatever was there is used to provide energy for the guard cells only. Surplus ATP is not there. So potassium ions cannot be actively pushed out, pushed inside the guard cells. They simply leak out. Once the potassium ions leak out, the guard cells become hypotonic. Once they become hypotonic, water goes out by exosmosis. The guard cells become flaccid and they close or in other words, the stoma closes. This happens at night. So during daytime, the stomata exchange gases. At night, the stomata are closed. So this is one structure which is regulated by the movement of the guard cells. So you had already done in the process, in the chapter of transpiration, that stomatal transpiration is the only type of transpiration which can be regulated. So now you can understand it better why it is regulated. So it's all based on the process of photosynthesis by the two theories, sugar concentration theory or the potassium ion concentration theory. So that's all in this video. The remaining we will cover in the next video. Hope you have understood it all. Thank you very much.
and God bless you all.